Hello and welcome. I'm Roy, this is Val. We're here today to talk about um, fitting and foiling, right? So the thinking is we're trying to do a series of these that talks about doing in this particular um, situation a copper foil method. And uh, we talked about cutting before and we uh, talked about using the grinder. If you haven't seen those particular presentations, you can find the videos on our the video section of our Facebook page or they're on our YouTube channel. Uh, if you want to go back and look at those, they're really quite riveting. Right, they're riveting. They're, they're definitely yeah, riveting. They are very <laughs> interesting. So um, we want to talk about fitting first. So the, our last talk, we were talking about using a grinder, and we were just showing some of the basics of how a grinder works and what you need to do. Uh, but uh, now we want to talk about, you know, so I've cut my pieces, I've used a grinder a little bit on them, and then how much do I need to grind to get them to fit the pattern? Uh, so one of the things that we had talked about prior was that so the black line of a pattern represents the space that the copper foil is going to take up. So in a perfect world, we would cut, when you're cutting your glass, you would cut inside the black lines. So you would always, right, if you're tracing your pattern on, you would cut off any of the lines and, and then it should fit inside. We're trying to get the pieces to fit inside the lines. So basically, too, just because I know this sometimes is hard. If you want to, if you, I don't know where you are. Here. <laughs> Look down here. Um, see, that's that's the problem. A lot of times, people will have the this. I mean, that looks like it fits fairly decent. But if you look close enough, this this amber piece has actually covered that entire black line. So sometimes when we think about it, or when I think about it, I think that that black line kind of doesn't belong to anybody. So in order for this piece to fit, it has to not cover a portion of the black line. And then the same thing with number six, you just have it come straight out to the black line. And then once you get your foil on both pieces, that sort of eats up that space. But that's how we look at it. Yeah. So, I mean, it's really sometimes deceiving, especially these these little tips. These could actually be, you know, even a little a little back because once you foil that, right, and yeah, then fold it down, it anyway, you're not gonna so, see it and yep. it's gonna, Cover that, but anyway, that's yeah. Val, you know, I think we got a close up of the circle. So uh, Val did a nice job of cutting and, and grinding on that one, and you can see how it, it it fits just inside the black line. You know, so I, I know uh, when Val and I were talking about this, the I know for both of us, we think it's real important that the more accurately you can cut, the less you have to grind, and the faster the process goes. Mm -hmm. I mean, we all know stained glass is time consuming enough as it is, so anything you can do to save some time is really a good thing. So. You know, try to cut, I, I, I know for me, I'm always trying to cut inside the black lines yeah. when I'm cutting all, all my project pieces. And then, then the, there you should only then be using the grinder to, um, you know, take off those little flares or those little bumps in the glass that, that doesn't quite break the way you want them to. Um, I have a, I grabbed an abrasive stone because I was uh, telling Val the other day that th when I first started out in stained glass, this is what I used to grind the glass was an abrasive stone. So. You know, I didn't have this, you know, electric fancy. And you can't really kind of reduce the size too much. Yeah. So, so I think for me, I learned to cut pretty accurately. And so I know when I'm teaching um, students in particular or talking to people about cutting glass, I mean, that's like my mantra is always, I mean, you, there's, you, you can never, you can, what, what is my mantra? So it's uh, that, you know, you have to cut, uh, the more accurately you cut, the less grinding you have to do, right? So there's, spend time you know working on your glass cutting skills and then you won't have to grind exactly. as much right so. exactly because it isn't fun to, to cut your piece out and then spend another two hours making them fit right yeah yeah so that's the other thing so too. that's what you know we were talking about fitting right so i know uh, i think val and i uh, both approach this a little differently which which is we thought was actually pretty good because there's not like a perfect way of doing any of this and and so you guys are just getting a val and mine opinion about how to do this so well, I mean, what works for us yeah what works for but us and you know We've been doing it in a while, we think it works pretty well, but you know, I know for me, when I'm uh, fitting my piece to a pattern, I cut out every piece of glass. I cut out the whole project first. And then I go back and start looking at them and deciding you know, which one fits, which one doesn't fit, and which one do I need to grind on, and which one I don't. And I know Val, I think, approaches it a little differently. Well, I do, and I think a lot of it, like you said about your cutting, you don't really like to grind or spend a lot of time or waste a lot of time, so you learn to cut better. And the same thing about the fitting the pieces, and I, and I also, too, think, because Roy and I have worked together long enough to know that, I mean, our personalities aren't exactly the same either. So what I don't like is to, I don't like repetition. I don't like to, I, I'm not just, if I cut my whole piece out and had it sitting over there and had to start taking one piece at a time, making it fit, making it fit, it, it's just too boring for me. So I usually cut one, sometimes two, pieces, and then I make them fit. 
and then I cut my next one and then I make it fit. It just seems for me and my personality having a stack over there that I know none of them fit right is a little bit too overwhelming for me. So, so but both ways, I mean, there's no right or wrong way. And I think no. like, a lot of this comes into what you end up liking about the process and what you don't. And some of the things that aren't our most favorite, like for me, it's grinding and foiling. Those aren't my favorite things to do. I love to cut glass and I love to solder. So anything I can do to yeah. eliminate some of that time I have to spend doing the foiling and the grinding, I'm gonna do. Yeah, I'm with you. I think that's the most tedious part of the process, yeah. right? And really probably the least creative part too of the, of the process is just, you know, the fitting and grinding and stuff. So um, we, uh, so, we would go up then and just start, you know, fitting pieces to the pattern, right? And whether you're doing it Val's way or my way, uh, I always think a, a great thing to do is narrow your focus when you're first looking at it, right? So as like yes. Val was mentioning. So we just look at a couple of pieces, see how they fit, and then introduce a third piece, and then, you know, we'll see how that fits. Grind that one, uh, and then come back. It, it sometimes is overwhelming if you, like, if you do it like I do, and all the pieces are cut, and you're laying there, and you're thinking, wow, this thing doesn't fit at all. But in reality, it's a lot of times it's just you know a little minor yeah. adjustment here or there, a little grinding here or there to, to get it to fit. So we would go about you know looking at each piece, getting them to fit inside. And you were going to talk about grinding all sides. Oh yeah, good point. Yeah. yeah. So one of the reasons why I cut everything out first, a couple of reasons. One is that I cut everything out first because let's just pretend like I cut one a little small. Um, but I, maybe I cut the other one a little big and now they fit and I don't really have to grind them. I and mean, maybe they don't fit the pattern exactly, but they fit each other, which is probably more important. And then I, I and don't the have to grind them. And the outside edge too. You gotta got watch that outside edge, but lots yes. of times you're right, you don't have to. But the other thing too is like, I, you know, as I'm probably coming, coming from my background, I, I only grind things that need to be ground, right? If, if something doesn't fit the pattern, I will grind that. But there's really no reason you know, if you cut this part here accurately, there's no reason to um, grind the outside edges of your glass. I mean, sometimes I know about, and I've both heard this from people before, they're like, well, you gotta grind every edge so the foil sticks to it. I'm pretty sure that that's not true No, for me you basically anyway, just so. grind when you need to grind yeah. to make something fit or to take off a sharp edge. But but other than that, you know, how lovely is it if you don't have to grind, grind all every four single, sides? Yeah, every yeah piece I know, else, right? love it. So if we, let's, you know, pretend that we have this piece all assembled, ready to go, right? We did all the grinding. Um, then the next step would be to foil it. And we wanted to talk just briefly about cleaning it, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, I know that when I'm grinding, I'm usually wiping off with a, with a towel or paper towels or something. And that's usually good enough. And I don't usually have to clean my glass any more than that. Um, that's you know, good enough for the foil to stick. Sometimes though, and I, we noticed it on this piece, when you're grinding and if you end up with this like white powder that's on the glass right you can see it kind of come off on my finger um that's ground glass you know from the grinder and you know the foil won't stick to that so that would have to get cleaned off so usually i don't worry about that until i'm getting ready to foil and i'll take a quick look at them and go oh yeah and then i just wipe off that one little area and then continue on mm -hmm. right and there's no reason again to clean the entire piece just well the basically too on. the other point to this too is that we don't use oil now, if we used oil, that would be a different story. If we had oil in our cutters, then there would be oil residue and that could affect the adhesive, oh, definitely. Yeah. So um, then there would be some more cleaning involved. I would say, you know, a little distill or something and just make yeah. sure you get that oil residue off because it'll affect how your foil sticks. But we don't, it, we kind of forget about that. Because yeah, I forget, we don't, sorry. We, we don't use it around we're, here, so. We're radical here, I guess, so Val and I anyways. We, don't use We're lazy. We don't want to clean it up. Yeah. I so want to clean it off, right? One more step. So absolutely, I want to address. Uh, we have two questions here. One from Rita talking about: Do we do classes? Yeah, we do a variety of classes. At the moment, you know, we're uh, since COVID hit, we've been doing a lot of private classes. So I mean, you can reach out to us, and we can set up a private class for you if you'd like. But we have begun um, to schedule too, mm -hmm. and they are on our website. Yeah, we're slowly starting to trickle our normal class schedule back up on our um, there. We have some June dates and some July ones, and we'll just keep adding as we go. But and that's at DelphiGlass.com backslash classes. And Debbie is wondering what colors of glass we're using, and we will go ahead and at the end of the video link all of those uh, so you guys can find them on our website. Oh yeah, great. I mean, this one uh, project here is the English Muffle uh, made by Wismark. If you're familiar with it, but it's Val. Do you know the colors? Um, amber and what's that one? <laughs> 
I'm quoting this. I'm that's sure. it. But there I you go. There's, it. We have two, two I values know. of amber. I know. Anyways. We'll have, find them for you guys. <laughs> they have fancy names like coronation gold or something oh. or whatever. So, but anyways. So uh, after we've got our pieces of ground fitting to the pattern and they're cleaned or they're relatively clean, then we're going to foil them. So uh, we want to, uh, you know, show you some differences in foils. And it, we appreciate the questions. And yeah, if you have them, you know, difference. I mean, go ahead and just, you know, make a comment in the section below. So start with backing or size? Let's start with Let's size. Let's talk about, yeah, that's usually okay. the question. That All right, get. size. So we have this little um, makeshift thing out here that just shows you the widths. So, you know, you can see 3 eighths, quarter inch, 7 thirty seconds, 3 sixteenths, and then there even is a 5 thirty seconds, which is much smaller. And a wider one. There's a half inch. And there's a half inch, yeah. yeah. We don't, I don't use that. I mean, I don't know that I've ever used a half inch, but I'm sure if that's what you want to do, then that's fine. But, um... 730 seconds has always been the sort of the go-to. Mm -hmm. It's kind yeah. of the, you know, works for almost everything. Yep. Um, so that's the one that we typically use if we're just doing like this, you know, this small project or whatever. So, um, the, do you want to make sure I go with the mills? Is, I mean, I don't know if there's any questions. About well, I'll talk about the widths again real quick. Okay. So, so the question we get often asked is, well, why are there different widths, right? I mean, so uh, one thing, one simple thing could just be maybe you're working with glasses that have different thickness to them. Like a textured like, glass? Yeah, like mm -hmm. a textured glass. Like, a, you know, or um, maybe you're um, putting pressed flowers be between two layers of glass. You would want a wider foil for that, you know, obviously. Um, but I think the, um, the biggest reason why you would use different widths of foil is that's what affects the width of your solder seam. Right, right, so this little example, we did this here just to show you. So this was 7.30 seconds. So you can see, you know, by the time you you center it and fold it down on both sides, which is what you have to do, by the time you do that, then you do the piece that's going to be next to it and you put them together and then that's what dictates the width of your solder seam. So some people even like maybe bigger solder mm -hmm. seams so they could use a wider foil sometimes, you know, for effect or a detail you might want to change the size within your piece. Um, I tend to go smaller more than yeah. bigger, but um, I don't know, it's, go ahead. Well, I tell, uh, I tell people to, I mean, this is, I guess, a personal thing, but I tell people work as narrow of a foil as you can because, I mean, my thinking is you want to see the glass, right? I mean, nobody, you know, you don't want to see big solder seams that, that covers up well, some of the yeah, glass. Well, yeah, and that but, is it, right? That so, is what we were taught, too, that, that, that the soldering isn't really part of the overall art piece. It's just the means in which you're holding it together. So you kind of are looking to not have it so big and bold and in your face that it detracts from the color and the movement and the shape and whatever the subject of the piece is, right? Sure. So it's supposed to just sort of blend in with the whole thing. So, so often the smaller is better. Yeah, I know like uh, uh, lamp makers often will use a really narrow foil because they're doing a lamp that has, you know, s sometimes several hundred pieces in that. And so and often they're really quite small. So again, the narrower the foil, the um, easier it is to see the little tiny small pieces of glass. The, the question we get asked sometimes though, is there a difference in strength, you know, between, you know, should I go to a wider foil because it's going to make my panel stronger? I mean. I'm not really sure that that's true. I mean, I would imagine that's probably true if you went a little wider, but it's not enough to, I wouldn't make a decision based on the width of the foil, how strong my panel is going to be. I can assure you if you're doing 3 16ths, which is one of the narrowest ones, and you're doing a large panel, it's still going to hold together. I mean, it, it'll mm -hmm. be pretty strong, so. Um. Yep. And often the, it's just determined by the size, like you said with the lamp situation, by the size of the piece that you're foiling. I mean, if you're going to use, you know, a quarter inch around a little tiny grape, um, by the time you foil around it, fold over the sides, burnish it down, and hold it up to the light, you're only going to see, you know, this tiny little circle of purple because the rest is going to be that copper foil. Well, this project, too, is a good example of it. If you had a lot of individual little corners, by the time you foil over all of these little pieces, you're not yeah, going to be able to see yeah, that work as well, well either. Where right. points are at, yeah, like we were mentioning earlier, where points are at, they just get kind of covered up, and obviously the wider the foil is, the more of the point that you're covering up. So, on. and we so. also know, like when you're first starting out, that, you know, I don't even have all these sizes. Hmm. I mean, I have 7 30 seconds, and I think I have 3 sixteenths, and, but, um, but sometimes, you know, when you're home and you're in the middle of a project, and all of a sudden you foil the piece, and you realize, oh my gosh, my size of foil has just really 
over covered my glass, it's too big, I don't have any other, I don't want to just stop. Um, we often do this with an X-Acto knife. So once you foil your piece, burnish it down, then you can hold it up and see how much of the glass, and if you don't see enough of it, just start taking your X-Acto and just start carving around the piece. And then you flip it up with the edge of your X-Acto and peel that off. And so you can actually use the thicker stuff and, and trim it down whenever you really feel like it's needed. So I think that's kind of a cool thing. Yeah, trick. I say that that's a real common thing, again, for, you know, you're thinking of Tiffany-style lamps, right? I mean, in that construction of those, people, I mean, use an X-Acto knife all the time to trim back foil so you can just see the glass better, so. Because basically, what about, too, the overhang? I mean, you don't need a lot of overhang. No. It's a, yeah, the, the foil doesn't need to wrap around the glass that much. Just uh -huh. enough to just get enough around to so we can... Just enough to get around the corner, so and then that will, around. that will work, yeah, yeah, so. So you want to talk about the thicknesses, then? Is that... The mills. Yeah, the mills, right? The mills. So, so we did get that. Someone did ask about that question. And and um, the, the, the tape does come in, it's not thickness, but it's actual thickness of the tape. And they call it a mill. So a good example is I like to do it with um, like this one. See, when I peel this one back, see how it starts to coil like that, kind of tight? That's usually... A thinner mill, like a 1.0. 1 1.25, that one might be. 1.25. The 1 1.5 is the heavy dutiest. Yeah, and I would say it's standard too. Standard, I would yeah. Say that's I would say standard. Yeah. So you can jump in here too because I, I just know that the one time I, I didn't realize that's what I, I was taught 1.5, that's all I knew there was. And then I was having a conversation with someone. I said, I don't know why you would ever use a 1 mill because. When you do peel it back, it just coils on itself and it gets tangled and it's kind of easier irritating. to tear too. It's so thinner, yeah. So. so then I had someone in a class one time that had done um, craft shows, and they had done just a ton of little sun catchers, and he said, "Well, the reason I do is because of my fingers." So when you foil something, you know, the next thing I do is I, I'll bend it down and do this. And then I do the corner, and in the corner, you're gonna have these sharp little edges that you have to do this to push down. And that can get, after a while, if you do 500 of those, and that stiffer foil, it, it makes a difference. The thinner foil I can see that. Doesn't, doesn't start to cause any real issue for at least a long time. So, and like we said before, the strength, I, I don't know that we really think that it's not as strong. I think it is. Sure. Yeah, so, I'm sure it's just as strong. Yeah, the other thing I, you know, I've talked about lamps a couple times, but there, but uh, people that make lamps also will go with the, the thinner foil, the 1.0 uh, mil, uh, because the thinking again is you're doing like a, a lamp with 800 pieces and each one of those pieces has, you know, foil on it. You can see where that can start to Build up. Uh, yeah, change mm -hmm. the fit of the piece as you're trying to put it on the mold. And so the thinner the foil is, less space it's going to take up is the thinking on that. So, so there's a couple of reasons like that, yeah. but it, it really, they all work. They so work, yeah. What if you had a rippled glass? Would the thicker foil do better with that so you're not tearing it? Yeah, that's, yes. that's a great thing. So yes. yeah, I think that's probably the biggest thing you'll notice if you start using the foils that are the 1.0 mil, for example. They just tear easier, so if you have a lot of you know dramatic inside curves, I mean, this piece isn't really a dramatic inside curve, but I could see where it would split or tear on you. The thinner foil, uh, you know, a 1.5 or a 1.25 mil will hold up a little bit better when you yeah. try to do that. Um, I guess the uh, uh, color backings, is that probably That's something next, yeah. About? yeah. So there are three, and I actually did it this way too, so you could actually see what. What about that stuff? Yeah, that I know, smart. right? Okay, so obviously copper, copper. So that means it's copper on both sides. Um, then they actually have one that's copper back here, but on the back, it's black. And then the same thing with silver. Copper on the outside, but silver on the back. And those are actually, this always sometimes is a little tricky for people to wrap their head around in the beginning, but this is how I word it, and then you can word it differently. Maybe. Okay. All right. So. I say that you choose the color backing of foil to match what you want the finished color of your solder to be. So when we solder, no matter what, it's gonna be silver, right? But then we have an option. We have op two options to turn it either copper or black. So 
Do you want to show those now? Sure. It might be. So, you know, so you it kind of depends. Mm -hmm. If you're using glass that is not see-through then it, or opaque, then the backing doesn't matter. But if you're using glass that is clear or you can see through, can then you, see you want, might want to be careful and choose the back color. I see that. Yeah. So if this is this black, yeah, that's it is. Black. So if that one, if this one we were going to turn our silver black after we were done soldering, we would use the black back because when we turn this black, then the fact that we were offset a little bit or off center with our foil isn't going to show. I don't know. Is that is that? Yeah. Sounding okay? Yeah, I'd say pretty much the same thing. I always tell people you match the back of your um, foil to match whatever, however you're going to leave your solder, whether that's you know leaving it silver, as Val mentioned, mm -hmm. or using a patina to change the color. Uh, and again, I think you said the same thing about if the glass is transparent enough that you can see through it, that that would be a reason. That's the time um, to do it. If yeah. it's not, if it's not, don't worry about what it is. Yeah, you know the, the copper tends to be the least expensive. Yeah, it's copper a, I was just going to say the same right? thing. Yeah. Copper is the least expensive. So if you're looking at that, I mean you, that, and you, again using opaque glass, or if it's really dark, then it really doesn't make that that big of a difference. But I can tell you, I think personally, I, I think it does make a difference choosing the right color backing. I mean, what what we hear sometimes is when people are soldering. And uh, they'll say, wow, I, I think I covered all the copper, but I can still see the copper. And it's because they're seeing the inside of the foil, not really the... From the back, the one that flipped over. Not the back. copper that they're just covered with solder. I mean, we're going to do uh, a soldering um, presentation, right? Uh, and probably, we think, in a couple weeks. So for those of you who are wondering when that's going to happen. Uh, and then we'll go over a little bit more about the soldering. So we're not going to talk a lot about soldering today. But that's the reason why there are different colored backs. Because they do actually have a purpose. Um, the other option, if you don't want to invest in the different color backs and you do um, maybe want to turn your your, your um, solder to a black or whatever, just you got to make sure you oil really evenly. Right. Oh, yeah. well, you see it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and you know, if you've ever foiled, that sometimes is a little easier than. Yeah, so for, yeah, especially done, for so. those of you that are new, I mean, when we were talking earlier about the widths of the foil, right? I mean, the wider the foil is, the easier it is to wrap it around the glass yeah. because there's more room for error. If you can't get it exactly in the center, it's not going to matter. But if you go to a really narrow foil and you don't quite get it perfectly centered, then it's possible that you won't get foil on one side of the glass. So, um, again, that might be the reason I, I know people will, as Valen mentioned, will foil with something a little bit wider and then just trim back, you know, with an exacto when they need to. So I think we're going to show you how to foil, right? Was that right uh, for those that, that haven't seen that before? Um, one of us is doing it by hand, or we foil? Well, you know, here's another thing. I know I'm pretty sure that Val and I don't do it the same way, right? No, so, we don't. This is this is true. Yeah, yeah. So, so, but we both get to the end yeah. process just fine. Which one right? do you want? I'll but just which jump one do you want? I'm going to do this one real quick. This one I was going to do with the machine. I think it's the machine. All right, so you want to do the circle, or you don't want to? Okay. I'll okay. Oh yeah, we didn't talk about this. Like, can you see how ours are in oh, these yeah, things? Yeah. Um, Our foil dispensers. Yes, yeah. and it, we have one in a box that it's over there on the cart. Yeah. Um, but anyway, this is one of those things. You know, there's a lot of bells and whistles and different kinds of burnishers, and we'll talk about show those in a minute. But there's all kinds of extras you can always buy, no matter what you're doing, right? There's sure. always these things. But I always feel like this is almost essential because when you take this out of the package, this foil, it's just a coil, right? And it kind of goes boing. And then you're trying to, oh, it's really very frustrating if it gets away from you. Yeah. And then you have oh, to yeah. wind it all back up. So these are real handy. Um, and they have different widths, so they accommodate you know several different widths of the foil. But they just feed in down at the bottom, and then you just pull out, and I, I'll show you, because I'll, I'll use this one to, um, let me do it this one. You just, I just pull it out a ways, and then pull, pull the, the backing away just enough um, so that I, have, I can get started but I don't have to unpeel the whole thing. So then I take my piece, I always lay it in my fingers like this. I take my piece of glass and I put it right, I center it, I look. If it looks centered, then I'll continue. If not, I'll pull it back off and start over again. This isn't actually a good piece for me to show how I do it different than you. Oh. Right, because no. this, I didn't have a choice of oh, where to start. Because you could have given me a different one. That's all right. Just. But anyway, see, I didn't quite like what I did there, so I pulled it back. And then you want to try not to do that too many times because you're kind of using up some of your adhesive. But you can do that a few times, and it's not going to hurt. And then 
Here's one of the things we're different though. Roy will come, well, I should say, I, well, I'll tell you what I do. I come mm -hmm. around and then where I started, I go over and then I look on the inside and make sure I'm flush with where I started, but I have overlapped a little bit. Roy doesn't overlap, do you? Well, I circles. Oh, you would, okay. But I do it on any piece. Yeah, yeah. I can, you know, if anybody's really interested. In how I do so it. then, so the next step is called crimping is kind of the technical term, right? For And that's just folding the foil down. And I think, again, you probably, I, I'm sure we don't do this the same either. I so. just do it with my finger. Yeah, I know. You, just, that's you don't? Oh, heck no. What do you do it with? I, we have tools. Oh, but you use a tool. <laughs> oh, okay. Yep, I just push it down with my fingers. And then, and then the, so you can tell, and I left this like this too, but you can tell now how puckery this is around the edge. You can see it's all bumpy. So that's actually an indication that the foil isn't real tight to the glass. And what we really need to do is get that burnished down or get all those air pockets um, out of there so that it can make a good solid contact with the piece of glass. So there's all kinds of tools you can use. This is a, what is this? Burnisher. Burnisher. Yeah, just like it's name. And then you just kind of, and if you can tell from where I, like here's a good start and stop, where I've done it and where I've not, you can tell it's really smooth right here, but here it's all puckery. That's what we're trying to do. This little roller is kind of a fun thing and I kind of like it. But that's what you're doing. And once you go around it and do it, I do both sides. You do both sides. Yep. Yep. And that particular tool has got a part on the end of it, which we showed in our photo yesterday um, oh, of yeah. how it kind of folds it over your edges as well for the foil. Yeah, it's got a fancy, it's yeah, got to be end like it, this, right? right? Yeah, so that does the crimping for you. Exactly. Hey, Sandy has got a question for us. Although the uh, holder for the foil is very handy, do you really want to expose all that foil to the air? Won't they turn green? Oh, oh well, thanks for asking, Sandy, because I, you know, I can tell you that for me, I put all my foil in Ziploc bags, right? If I'm not going to uh, use it right away. Yeah, this And then this, thing. you could, yeah, I just stick that whole thing right in a Ziploc bag, you know, a larger Ziploc bag and close it up. But yeah, thanks for asking, because that's good. It can oxidize. Yeah, that's, it, it can oxidize fairly quickly. Yeah, I know, I keep mine in my basement, so, you know, it's got a damp Michigan basement. So. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, so then, oh, you want me to foil something to show you how I like, do it a little differently? Is that, um, um, well, I don't care, or you got to show that. To show the machine. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, well, I have this can, uh, fancy, oh, I, well, I'll just tell you as we're kind of working. So I do foil a little differently than Val does. Uh, I mean, it's a minor thing, but l l let's say I was foiling this particular piece. I always start on a point, um, and then I work the foil around to finish where I started. So I don't overlap foil, uh, or I try not to overlap foil. Obviously, the circle has to get overlapped because there's not like a point on there. So, Katie, okay, you might get in here. We'll just uh -huh. show he starts on the point. See, I always start about a half an inch in from a corner. I don't ever start on a corner because that, for me, it's the way I was taught. But that, for me, makes me helps me see the the both sides of my piece, and then I I stick that end on, and then I feel like I can start rolling up and as opposed to starting. But I think it's just what you get used to doing when you learn, right? I think it's this totally is the way yeah. I learned, and yeah. so. Doing it your way would be awkward. Well, for me. part of it is too. Um, can I um, oh, see some of the foil? I'll just show it real quick. Yeah. So part of it is, you know, you maybe you've heard me mention lamps a couple times. So that's part of my mentality is thinking about, you know, I kind of relate some of this to like uh, lamp making. And so the thinking is that if you know, again, I'll use that 800 piece lamp as an example. If every one of those pieces had a double thickness of foil on it somewhere that can interfere with how the lamp is going to fit again, right? So I, I tried to avoid overlapping for that reason. And so whenever I'm doing something that has a point on it, you know, I'll start there. And um, I don't, um, you know, you'll, you might notice I don't start right at the end because that takes, you know, like a few minutes to try to line it up. And I'll just get close to the end like this and then trim it back so that it's, now it's flush with the top of the glass. And then I'll come around and just foil the whole thing. Um, I, when I'm foiling, I look at, I'm looking at on top of the glass and I'm trying to see both sides of the foil at the same time. 
And I can tell you, it really helps if you got a nice light source behind you mm -hmm. that kind of catches the foil, right? That, so the foil lights up. Um, I, I know people do it differently. I'm pretty sure you do you look at I, one side. Yeah, or... I just get it. I get it centered, and then I just watch the one side and try yeah. to continually match that same overhang. Same difference. Yeah, I know. No, I mean, so it's it all just it, you get the same results at the end. So yeah. I'm not going to continue doing the whole thing just because uh, I think you guys kind of get the idea on that. I did want to show you though we have this kind of fancy table foiler. You know, sometimes you know, like as Val mentioned earlier, you you get used to doing something and that's you know that to you that's the normal what to do. And I'm so used to foiling by hand that that some of the other little tools that we have I'm not I don't always they're not always my go to. But but people who run into problems with foiling, if you have a hard time getting it centered. Um, then that's what's really nice about this table foiler. It is one of those things that where I can just rest the glass here on this little um, table part here, and so I don't have to steady it, which is sometimes the tricky part, you know, when you're trying to uh, get foil right in the center. This little um, wheel here is, uh, you'll see the opening on it here is for a specific size of foil. So it comes with the three most common sizes, 3 16 I have 7 30 seconds in there, and then a quarter inch. So I can swap out these depending on what's with the foil I'm working with. Uh, I have it kind of set up. I don't know how well you can kind of see the setup. I mean, it comes with really nice directions to show you how to do it, but it sets up here. So now when I'm pulling the glass, oh, so the, the foil is in there with sticky side in there. And then I'm gonna just put the glass in. So the sticky side is facing yeah, outwards. Sticky side facing me. I guess I didn't say that very clearly. And. Uh, so all I'm gonna do is come around and roll it. So one of the things that you'll notice is that it also crimps it. Um, do you see how it's kind of folding it down so it gets on there? And then I'll just kind of come around. Sometimes it gets a little trickier on the corners. Uh, you have to kind of pull the glass out a bit. The only th thing I find sometimes a little tricky about these is that when I start coming around to where I, I started, it starts kind of pulling off what I've already done, which again, is not the end of the world. Cause it, oh, scissors, please. So if I was doing this, I would, um, my technique would be just to cut it there, right at the point, and then I just have to finish doing the, the top part by hand, which is not that big of a deal, right? And just line up the foil, and uh, and then just trim it off so that it meets up. And then we would uh, crimp it, which again is folding it over. You know, I know Val uses her fingers. We talked about using some uh, cheap, uh, sometimes I just use a burnisher is what actually what I do if I do this and I'll do this to kind of get it over there. Um, sometimes people will use what's called a FID, if you've seen this tool before. It's used a lot of times for lead cane work, uh, especially like opening up the channels and, and pushing in putty, but I mean, it works, right, for doing the same thing, right? Burnishing again is just rubbing the foil tight uh, here, uh, or crimping, right? I can use it to fold the foil down on top. Uh, we also have this other little nice uh, tool called a quick crimp, and um, it does sort of the same thing where you just, uh, once you get it in there, you run it through here and pull it through and then it will, um, you can see how it kind of crimps it down. It does help to start it, you know, on this, on, I know on Val was pointing out the, you know, where the corners where foil meets is always the kind of the tricky part. It's easy to kind of flip those up. Uh, and so we want to try to avoid that. So I always kind of fold those down first and then you can use a tool to come in and then you can kind of run through it. Uh, and, burnish and no matter what you on, use on there, to, to crimp and burnish, you always want to go, you, you can't, you don't want to push towards the foil because you will whip it up. Yeah. I mean, you always have to be kind of mindful of how you're going about it so you go at it, you know, so that you won't raise this lip up. So you go at it, you know, more like that or something. You get what I mean. But because it, until it's really down tight, you could, you can lift it or tear it, you know, so you have to kind of be a little careful no matter how you're burnishing. All right, we had a couple questions that came in um, that we'll just address real quick. So Sandy had asked why we don't use oil when cutting, and I know we kind of addressed that on some of our cutting videos, but if you guys wanted to do just a quick snippet on. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll give you my point of view real quick, was um, when I when I t learned to do stained glass, I sort of taught myself, and I had this, you know, $2 glass cutter I got from the hardware store, you know, those little steel ones, and there's no place to put oil. I never knew anything about oil until I ran into somebody later that told me that I needed oil to cut glass. And then I thought, well, that's kind of interesting because I've been cutting glass and I haven't used any mm -hmm. oil. So, um, and then I thought, well, maybe I should use oil, but Val mentioned the most perfect thing to me, you know, I'm lazy and that's just one more step, you know, that I have to clean all the oil off. 
And to be honest, I didn't find that I cut any better no. with oil. In fact, I, I think it's kind of a, I, I don't know, I don't want to say throwback, but I, I do think originally that was the way it was done because the tools did rust you know, way back when, and they're not the metals they are today. So I think that sometimes a lot of the use of oil was to preserve the tool, you know, to prevent yeah, rusting and that. things like that. But then over the years, I think some people have really believed that it's it, it also helps facilitate a better score. And I don't know, maybe it does. I'm just the opposite of him. I, I was taught to use it. And then when I started working here, and nobody was using it. And nobody, then what are you doing now? We don't cut a single sheet down with oil. No. So I think the difference is now is that, you know, the, the, our glass petters are carbide, so they don't dull and they don't rust. And um, and for us who started trying it, I mean, I'm not interested in washing 25 pieces in a stained glass piece once I've cut and ground them to get the oil off. In our fusing, I'm not interested in cutting my pieces of glass and then having to go use some kind of detergent to wash them all off. I mean, we don't have oil in the cutters. We just have a damp towel or a you know paper towel that rinse it, dry it, and off we go. So, so the cleanup is definitely easier. But we sell it, and we have oil cutters. We have cutters that, that have chambers for oil. So it's not like we're against it. It's just we don't use it. Yeah, we don't. But you know, again, what. These little presentations that Val and I are doing is it's just our opinion about things. And uh, I mean, we, we realize there's a lot of other opinions out there. These are just the things that work for us. I mean, I mean, if you're using oil in your cutter now and you're cutting great with it, then I mean, I would just, yeah, might just continue using it. Well, exactly. It, right? so. I think anytime you do anything and you're not having an issue, then there's no real reason to change yeah, what you're doing. I would agree with that. Yes. Awesome. And then Rita had asked uh, where we are located. Our only store is here in Lansing, Michigan. Yeah. I know it's beautiful Lansing, Michigan. Yeah. So. We had many locations at one point, but now we're just down to the one here. Yeah, feel free to come. Anybody come come visit us. Yeah. We'd love to have you here. So, um, well, you know, thanks for watching and thanks for all the questions. We yeah, appreciate right. that. And if you think of something afterwards, like I said, just you know, go ahead and you can uh, email us at Facebook at DelphiGlass.com or you can send us a message on, on Facebook or Instagram. And uh, we'll probably be here in a couple of weeks, I think two weeks uh, from now on Wednesday. Soldering? And we're going to talk about soldering. Yeah, Yay, so if you want to yes, come back for that, that'll be the fun one. Yeah. Great. Thanks, yeah. everybody. Yeah.